If you're watching this channel, it's because you don't enjoy watching the world squander what Christendom built, but you want to do your part. And chances are you've heard me mention a great means by doing just that. Email made by and for Catholics. Check out fide.email. That's F-I-D-E-I dot -E email. Built for Catholic individuals, families, organizations, and groups. They're private, secure, and of course, they're Catholic. And they're offering two months off on your first year for an annual subscription if you enter the coupon code return to tradition without spaces that's the name of this channel without spaces at checkout last year the vatican had its trial of the century that trial focused on we are told cardinal betchew he was the man deemed most responsible for the financial wrongdoings going on involving the vatican funding Movies like Rocket Man. If you're familiar with the Elton John biopic, yes, Vatican donations, your donations to the Vatican and other donations went to fund that movie. As well as land, land and real estate speculation deals in London and a whole host of other problems. He has been deemed the one criminally negligent in that, as well as responsible for purposefully bad wrongdoings. And... You would might think, well, it's good that somebody is finally actually getting their just desserts for this stuff. But there have been whispers for some time that Cardinal Betchew was the fall guy. In fact, he even himself said this. And to make it weirder, before his trial began last year, Cardinal Betchew was given a place of favor in Francis's court. He was given a seat of prominence at the consistory that Francis held last summer when he named a whole host of bishops as cardinals. He was given a place of prominence to sit there, to sit. Almost as if Francis was saying, you have my favor. While then, in a duplicitous way, changing the rules numerous times for how the Vatican handles such investigations and how the Vatican's legal system handles such things. And... It's always interesting when the secular world chimes in and chastises Francis for something because Francis has the favor of the secular authorities. He very clearly does. He hosts their conferences in the Vatican. They congratulate him on his papal encyclicals. They do strange things when it comes to the secular authorities and the in the relationship we would expect the modern world and its governments to have with the Vatican. It's kind of alarming. In fact, when we think about it for half a second... But here they're even chastising him, saying that what he is doing with Betchew is wrong. And it casts a lot of doubt on whether Betchew was the one who really was responsible for this stuff, or if he was simply the fall guy. And so, for this story, we go to the Associated Press. Yeah, the Associated Press, the AP, with this headline. The first outside legal analyses of Vatican's trial of the century are in, and they're critical. You could say they're critical. That's fair, <laughs> put it mildly. The um, the short version is that they're that the Vatican is being accused of having thrown out all basic norms of justice. No democracy, no modern state, even some of the non-democratic states out there, would change the rules of how trials are held in the middle of a trial, except for some of the most re re repressive regimes out there. And Francis has done that with Cardinal Betchew, while giving him a place of prominence at a consistory, making it look like he was favored. One wonders if, uh, in hindsight, the signal that he was sending with him wasn't that he was favored, but that he's being made an example of. Here's what the critique of this sounds like, though, from the AP. Quote, Several prominent law lawyers have published stinging academic critiques and legal opinions about the Vatican's recently concluded trial of the century, highlighting violations of basic defense rights and rule of law norms that they warned could have consequences for the Holy See going forward. The opinion cite Pope Francis's role in the trial, since he secretly changed Vatican law four times during the investigation to benefit prosecutors, and they call into question the independence and impartiality of the tribunal, since its judges swear obedience to Francis, who can hire and fire them at will. The critiques underscore the growing problems on the international stage for the peculiar microstate that the Holy See calls home, an absolute monarchy where Francis wields supreme legislative, executive, and judicial power. End quote. 
always find it funny when they make comparisons to Francis being an absolute monarch because most of your absolute monarchs in history weren't actually all that bad. They just, yeah, they re exercised power in an arbitrary way, but the great check on their power came from their fear of God. The ones who weren't bad. There were obviously a whole host of bad ones. You can easily rattle them off in the comments if you want, but what checked them was knowing full well that they would stand before God one day in judgment for the things they did as a monarch. And as such, they moderated what they did a great deal. Unless, of course, they were deluded enough to think that evil deeds they did were the will of God. Many such cases in history, unfortunately. We don't see that here with the man alleged to be Pope. That's incredible to think about. That you would think that he, the man who preaches charity and mercy would do so in the most basic way when it comes to making sure those accused of doing wrong things with the church would get the most transparent hearing they could possibly get. You would think so. But that's not what happened here. These scholars, normally I don't like looking at secular experts for things, but what they're saying here is incredible. What they're not saying isn't wrong either. Everything they say, what you're about to hear, is true. Here's a lengthier quote. The legal opinions are likely to feature in the appeals within the Vatican court system of the nine people who were convicted in December of several financial crimes linked to the Vatican's bungled 350 million euro or 380 million dollar investment in a London property. And they could also be raised during the current review of the Holy See's compliance with European norms at the Council of Europe. During two years of hearings, defense attorneys highlighted many of the same issues now raised by outside analysts. But the tribunal led by Judge Giuseppe Pinatone repeatedly rejected their motions. After the first verdicts were issued, the Vatican's editorial director, Andrea Tornielli, insisted that the process had been fair, that the judges acted independently, and that the trial was carried out, quote, in full respect of the guarantees for the suspects. Geraldina Boni, a professor of canonical and ecclesiastical law at the University of Bologna and an advisor to the Vatican's legal office, disagreed in an article published Monday in the peer-reviewed legal journal of the University of Milan. Writing with church legal experts Manuel Gunarin and Alberto Tomer, Boni described the four secret executive decrees that Francis penned during the investigation as giving prosecutors, quote, essentially and a bit surreally carte blanche to pursue their case without any judge overseeing them. The decrees, which were never published, gave prosecutors authorization to intercept suspects' communications and take, quote, whatever precautionary measures against them were necessary, including deviating from existing Vatican law. The defense only learned about their existence once the trial was underway. Boney, who said she was asked to provide a legal opinion for the defense of Cardinal Angelo Becciu, who was convicted of embezzlement, said the decrees represented a clear violation of the right to a fair trial, which calls for the, quote, equality of arms between defense and prosecution. It's obvious that the people under investigation in the case were placed in a situation of substantial and onerous disadvantage, given that they were completely unaware of the prosecution's new investigative powers and thus unable to reasonably foresee the effects of their actions, she wrote in the in State, Church, and Confessional Pluralism. Francis has seemingly sought to justify the measures taken to get the trial off the ground, telling tribunal staff in 2023 that they should, quote, avoid the risk of confusing the finger for the moon or allowing obstacles to stand in the way of a greater good. But Boney argued that in criminal and procedural law, the ends cannot justify the means. Such an attitude, she warned, could end up justifying any conduct and use of sovereign power in the search at all costs for the, for the, at all costs for the guilty. End quote. The argument for Francis's through his mouthpieces is that the ends justify the means. Let's bring in something, a source I don't like using much, which for newcomers might surprise you. I don't like using the contemporary catechism of the Catholic Church because it's actually a very clunky document that was said by the cardinals who put it together in the 1990s that it wasn't actually that good of a document and it would need to be fixed, and then never was. If you compare it to older catechisms, it's not a great, it's, it's much harder to use than older catechisms had been. But current catechism of the Catholic Church, numbers 1753. This is on the ends justifying the means. So quoting the catechism, 
A good intention, for example, that of helping one's neighbor does not make behavior that is intrinsically disordered, such as lying and calumny, good or just. The end does not justify the means. Thus, a condemnation of an innocent person cannot be justified as a legitimate means of saving the nation. On the other hand, an added bad intention, such as vain glory, makes an evil act that, in and of itself, can be good, such as almsgiving. So if you're giving alms, uh, end quote, but if you're giving alms and you're doing it to puff up your chest and your ego, it turns a good deed into a bad one, right? Even if there's a good outcome for it. The ends don't justify the means. And there's, St. Thomas had a lot to say on the subject. The church has spilled a lot of ink on this because this is one of those recurring problems in politics and philosophy. Does a good outcome justify evil means to get there? Apparently, Francis seems to think so. And which puts a lot of his actions in the last 11 years into a new light, if you ask me. Now, as an aside, I want to cut off something here that will uh, that is almost certainly going to be said in the comments, and that some have claimed that the maxim, the ends justify the means, comes from the Jesuits. We can easily believe modern Jesuits, Jesuits of today, saying such nonsense, but not real Jesuits. I'm going to give you an ex interesting example of this from relatively recent Catholic history, from about 100 years ago. The 1910 New Catholic Dictionary has this to say on the ends justifying the means and this idea that it comes from the Jesuits. Okay, quote, A maxim which is true if the end and means be good, not if either be evil. This maxim or practice was attributed to the early Christians in the sense that they were doing evil in order to obtain something good. And not rather, as we are slandered and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that may good come from it. The Jesuits were accused of approving any evil means in order to attain their end. In 1852, a German Jesuit, Father Rowe, offered a thousand florins to anyone who could find such approval in any Jesuit author. The, author, the offer was repeated in 1863, later in the United States, but there were no takers. In 1903, an ex-Jesuit, Count Holmesbrook, who, when a Jesuit had repudiated the slander, claimed now that it was well-founded. When challenged to prove by Father Dasbach, a member of the German parliament, he submitted passages from 13 leading Jesuit theologians. Father Dasbach had stipulated that they be examined by a jury of Protestant and Catholic university professors. The Protestants, refusing to serve, the Count sued Father Dasbach for the reward. The Supreme Court of Cologne, on March 30th, 1905, decided that no, no one of the citations was the maxim employed in the sense attributed to the Jesuits. End quote. And what does that mean? It means there have been numerous attempts in history to prove the Jesuits are the ones who came up with this idea that the ends justify the means, and it's not true. Now, only bringing that up, so I wanted to make sure to cut off that critique, because I know it's coming. I know that there are a lot of Protestants who show up in my comments trying to, you know, Tell people to come out of her. <laughs> Look, the Jesuits evil. And then give you the weirdest ideas about what the Jesuits were. Th that saying doesn't come from them. I'm not really sure where it comes from, but it doesn't come from the church. In fact, the church has repudiated this idea consistently through its history. And for whatever reason, Francis invoked the ends justifying the means as a basis for it being okay for him to change the rules of legal proceedings to go after Betchew. Let me know what you think of that in the comments, please. You think that's okay? That it's okay to change legal rules in the midst of a, of a court case? Let me know. Um, and uh, hit like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. So to sharing this on social media, that helps too. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.